Okay, thanks for coming today. This presentation is part of the Friends uh, My Chicago Day My Chicago River Day Summer Challenge series. Um, so we have a series of let's see here and it's not working. There we go. So we have a series of presentations. Hopefully you came out today to talk to hear about Chicago River water quality because that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, we've got a couple great ones coming up with Deep Tunnel and Wildlife Habitat and some information about the Bridge House Museums and presentations really throughout the summer uh, on these Saturdays. And um, I'm actually going to reference some of those presentations in my presentation. I'm not going to stomp on their, their information. So here's all of our sponsors for Chicago River Day 2020. Um, these are all the corporations and foundations that are generous enough to help to make these presentations possible. This week's feature sponsor is the RBC Foundation USA. So today that's who's sponsoring this presentation. And just as a reminder, anyone can sign up to be part of the Chicago River Day Summer Challenge this summer. So uh, you pledge your support at a website at chicagoriver.org. Take a look at all the tools and the safety guidelines take some pictures and then make sure if you have social media to promote the challenge to your friends and family and we can really have an impact on sort of an unusual summer. And then finally, you can always support friends by becoming a member. Uh, right now, mem new members are matched by the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation. So it's a great time to join if you're not already a member. So with that, I'm gonna get started with today's presentation. So Friends of the Chicago River was founded in 1979. Our mission is to improve and protect the Chicago River system for all the people, plants, and animals that live in our watershed. So we do that in a variety of ways, and what I'm going to, and those are sort of education and outreach, policy and planning, and on-the-ground projects. Today, I'm really going to focus on policy and planning and a little bit of on-the-ground projects uh, to talk about how all these things work together to make a picture of the water quality in the Chicago River. One of the most important aspects of the work that Friends does as far as impacting water quality on the Chicago River is our water quality advocacy work. So that's working with uh, elected officials in collaboration, sometimes in opposition, public agencies, federal agencies to ensure that our water quality laws are met and then they're improved as they should be and as uh, critical laws like the Clean Water Act require that they are. Um, our goal and the goal of the Clean Water Act is to make the Chicago River fishable and swimmable. So that's every branch of the Chicago River. Uh, it should be clean enough for people to swim in and not worry about getting hurt. It doesn't mean that there's going to be beaches or the infrastructure for swimming, but it, what it does mean is that if you go in that water, you shouldn't be concerned about the, the, the negative impacts from that. And then fishable means that it should support a healthy native fish population that is uh, reproducing and producing large enough fish to for fishermen to be able to anglers to come and catch and, and, and keep. So a healthy reproducing native fish population. So Chicago is really unique. Um, it certainly is worth going a little bit through the history of the city and how we ended up where we are today from a water quality perspective. So I'm gonna take a, some big steps back and talk about some of the key points in the history of the water system that we have. So Chicago, one of the first municipal water supply systems in 1853, we pulled the water from the lake, piped it out into the city. 1857, we got our first combined sewers. So combined sewers are sewers that take all the drainage from streets and from houses and factories, anything that goes down a pipe goes into one pipe. And at this point, actually today, those combined sewers go right into the river. Uh, at this point in time, they went right into the river without any treatment. Nowadays, if we have really intense rainstorms, we still get untreated wastewater into the Chicago River from combined sewers. So there's really two conditions that are important to, to think about when we're talking about water quality in the Chicago River. And this really goes back to this combined sewer issue. When it rains, uh, we get an, an excess amount of water into our pipes and that excess, uh, there's sort of a few uh, relief points. One relief point are the combined sewer overflow outfalls that go into the Chicago River. Another relief point are people's basements. And another relief point that we, you know, that happened just, just recently is releases to Lake Michigan through 
the locks at Wilmet, at uh, downtown or in Calumet. So I'm gonna to talk today about dry weather conditions. So dry weather conditions are conditions when it hasn't been raining. So we're not, uh, you know, we're talking about water quality that's not being impacted by CSOs. You should sign up for the presentation in two weeks that Chelsea Grassfield's gonna give about deep tunnel because deep tunnel is one of the main factors in addressing wet weather water quality impacts in this region. And that's what's on the docket in a couple weeks for that. So we had an inherent conflict in Chicago. We were putting our sewage into the Chicago River and we were pulling our drinking water out of Lake Michigan. But in the near shore water conditions, that water that was polluted by the sewers was also being you know, gathered up and sucked in through the streets, um, uh, through the pipes and, and out into people's drinking water. So the solution to that was to reverse the Chicago River. So it required the digging of a few major channels there in red on this map. Uh, and the, move, the movement of the cribs further out into Lake Michigan to get some cleaner water. Um, all this reversal happened sort of between 1887 and 1922. It uh, dramatically changed the ecology and the water flow and the water quality of the river really forever. So that's something that condition that we deal with today. We also have five wastewater treatment plants in our system. We have two up on the north side in the north shore of the, of the, of the north branch of the Chicago River, one at Deerfield and one at Clavey Road, just kind of over the border into Lake County. And then we have three plants on the Chicago River, the Calumet River in, in or near the city of Chicago, the Calumet plant, the north side plant, which has since been named the Terry O'Brien plant, and then the Stickney plant. The Stickney plant is the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world with a capacity to treat about 1.2 billion gallons a day to give you an idea of uh, the size. To give you an idea of what happens when we have an overflow into Lake Michigan, typically when we have an overflow at Wilmette, it will be on the capacity of 10 to 15 billion gallons of water. So that, you know, to give you an idea of what, uh, what we're talking about from a system, it's a lot of water. One of the main things that Friends advocated for for many years, technically we are responsible for the longest uh, pollution hearing in the history of the state of, the, of Illinois, where we argued that the MWRD should, uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District should meet a higher uh, standard at their wastewater treatment plant effluent um, facilities so that uh, much of the rest of the country was disinfecting their wastewater. So they, that means that before it was released back into the environment, it was treated with either UV or, uh, dis uh, radiation or uh, chlor chlorination, dechlorination, or some other techniques to disinfect that. Um, but the MWRD wasn't doing that at their plant. So we embarked on a long case to, to really make the, the case that people were in the water uh, recreating and that they deserve to have water disinfected. This is an idea of what the water looked like before disinfection. So this is from 2002 in the North Shore Channel. Um, the north side plant, the Terry O'Brien plant, the, the, the graphs to the left are the fecal coliform units that are in the column of water before, um, before the plant. And then the columns to the right are the, the units after the plant has discharged. So that gives you an idea of the impact that that plant was having just on bacterial co uh, contamination. This slide gives you an idea of what you can do with disinfection. So the two graphs on the left are, are MWRD plants. Um, the blue graph is what's coming out. This is prior to disinfection at the pipe the sort of grayish graph is what's downstream of the pipe. So that gives you an idea of how uh, the sun is also a natural disinfectant. So you get some benefit from a, on a sunny day. So sort of what that benefit is. The three graphs to the right are other plants that disinfect. So what that tells you when you see the blue graph that's, that's shorter than the gray graph is that they are actually disinfecting at a lower rate than the background, just the natural amount of fecal coliform that's in those rivers. On a, you know, if that plant wasn't discharging at all. So in those cases, you see that there's little to no effect from those wastewater treatment plants from a bacterial contamination point of view. So that's what we were arguing for in Chicago, specifically at the Terry O'Brien plant and the Calumet plant, where we have thousands of people every year recreating in those waters. 
So we, we won that case and in 2015, we had new water quality standards that were approved for the river. Those, those standards include uh, more stringent standards for fecal coliform, for temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen, fish breathe like people do. Well, they don't breathe like people do, but they breathe oxygen like people do. And then chlorides, so um, road salts and things like that. Not all of these standards are in effect right now. Some of them are being phased in and we're working on all of that. But over time, we're gonna see vast improvements in all of these things. To the point where people can swim in the river. The last couple of years, we've done something called the big jump down in at Ping Tom Park. We've had, you know, last year, I think we had 30 some people jump in the river from elected officials just to community members. Um, these are people, to people that work for them, MWRD, so they know what the water quality is. And they all were willing to jump in the river and swim around a little bit. And this is something uh, that, an event that we do that's a great community event um, that also is a great way to showcase that uh, the Chicago River is really changing and becoming much more of a recreational asset. So I didn't talk much about nutrients. So nutrients uh, in our area is mostly uh, uh, phosphorus pollution. Um, this picture is from Lake Erie. Um, this is not what we wanna see in the Chicago River, these large algal blooms. So we're working closely with our colleagues at the Sierra Club and um, Open Lands and the MWRD to do a study to really take a science-based approach to lowering the nutrient load in the Chicago River um, through uh, nutrient recovery uh, and reducing the amount of nutrients that get, gets put into our system. So that's a project that we're working on where we're gonna see a report come out. It's expected to come out in 2023 that will dramatically lower the standard in the river for nutrient pollution. Chlorides, everybody in Chicago loves dibs. So that's part of the fun of our winter here. Uh, chlorides is road salt. Uh, Chicago has a lot of history with road salt. Um, it's affected mayoral elections um, and we're kind of behind the curve on using innovative, less ecologically impactful ways to keep our streets safe and clear in the winters. So we're doing work uh, really as close as Lake County, Illinois has a great program and looking at programs in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota has a great program. They have done a lot of salt reduction and they certainly have to deal with ice and snow there. So we are working on a regional approach as part of our Chicago River Watershed Council to look at sensible salting. So taking basic steps to use less salt, to brine your salt, uh, to wet it before it apply, you apply it to pavement, to train salt applicators, to work with municipalities for more responsible salting, and then finally to work with private industry and uh, large facilities to address how they use salt in the winter. I think mostly the, the, the key answer is we just need to get used to using less salt on our streets because all that uh, runs off into the river. A lot of the, it, the uh, water quality pollutants and impacts that I'm talking about today can be addressed with plants and, and other types of ecological improvements. Salt cannot. So salt is one that it gets in the system and it really impacts things like reproducing fish, uh, water quality. And, it, and you see that impact. If you take a look at the water quality uh, chloride levels, that impact really lasts throughout the year. It kind of diminishes during the summer, but it never fully goes away from the amount of salt that we put in our streets in the winters. And then one topic that's sort of near and dear to my heart is floatables, which is just a fancy jargony way of saying litter in the water. Uh, we can do a lot to clean up all the different things that I've talked about today from bacterial contamination to dissolved oxygen to chlorides. But if you're walking over a bridge in Chicago and you look down and you see a Cheetos bag and a Gatorade bottle, it certainly is not um, an aesthetic that looks inviting from a, a waterway. And this is the issue that we have in urban waterways, especially, especially is litter control. And we're working with waterways all over the US to be more innovative in how we do on the water litter capture with skimmer boats and uh, captive capture technologies. But really the key, that's the last place we want to address litter. We don't want to have to address it in the water. We want to address it before it gets in the water. So really there's a, there's a lot of sort of best management practices with 
everything as simple as keeping covered uh, garbage cans and make sure they get emptied on a regular basis to things like being more innovative about how we, we use street sweeping technology and to, to maybe prioritize river edge streets before we know a rainstorm is coming for additional street sweeping to get some of that 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 trash that just runs right off into our into our waterways. So finally, uh, another really innovative way that we do work and to improve water quality that's going to lead into sort of where I'm going to take the rest of this is stormwater management in restored open spaces. So these pictures are from Kickapoo Woods uh, on the south side and we've done a lot of work down there to restore the plant community to native plants. Native plants suck up a lot more water into the ground. That water goes through the ground and gets cleaner before it goes into the Chicago River. This site in particular was at one point um, sort of graded for development and then it was never developed. So there was sort of, a, there were some ditches and things that we were able to disconnect and then reroute that water through open space and really diminish the amount of direct runoff to the river of storm water that carries a lot of sediment and pollutants and, and put that water into the ground where it can be managed and cleaned. And the, the other side of that benefit uh, is that we get to do some really innovative urban habitat at the same time. So I talked a lot about the chemical composition of water, water and how that affects water quality standards. And, and one of the sad things about how uh, we set our water quality regulations is oftentimes the regulations that we set for fish and wildlife are used, are set at, at a, 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 something called the fatal end point, which is really a terrible way to say, at this temperature, this is when we start killing fish, or at this level of pollutant, this is when fish start dying. And that's a terrible way, I think, I think personally to set water quality standards. So at Friends, we really look at ways to max out what we have. So how can we max out the water quality that we have for the fish populations or other other type of animals. Um, so, and that for friends and, and for uh, for people to do the work that we do, that's a key part of the water quality picture. So we do all kinds of urban habitat. We talk about ospreys and bats and turtles. If you want to hear about ospreys and bats and turtles, you should sign up for the presentation on July 11th by Maggie Jones. She has a ton of experience with these things and it's gonna be a great presentation and she's gonna talk about a lot of that stuff. Today, I'm gonna to talk about aquatic habitat. So the projects that we do in the water to really provide space for fish and all the insects and mussels that live in the water column. So uh, for many years, we had a project called the Fish Hotel right outside our Chicago River uh, Bridge House Museum. And the top had some plants and it looked nice, but really the action that we were trying to, trying for was the stuff under the water. So we had some some cribs and things, and we called it the fish hotel because it's a good sort of it, it makes it it's it, it's catchy, and also because this was designed to do everything that people do in a hotel. So fish could come and hang out for a while. It's set in the main stem where there's a lot of boat traffic. It had spots where fish could eat. They could meet other fish. They could stay over. Uh, so it really did a lot to, to preserve and uh, create new urban habitat in really seawalled environments like the Riverwalk. We knew this was important because we have lots of evidence of fish throughout the system. Uh, a couple of these are right from the Riverwalk. Um, and we knew from talking to fisheries biologists that we work with that as the water quality was getting better, it was becoming less of a limiting factor. And what we were really being limited by was habitat. Um, and so that we had to come up with a way to really create habitat in an urban environment that as our habitat improved in, collabor in correlation with the water quality, it would support uh, ever increasing, more robust, more diverse fishery for things like great blue herons. We know that we see birds throughout the system. If you see birds like this walking around the river, they're not doing it uh, because they love walking in the river, although it is pretty cool if you get the opportunity to walk around in the river. They're doing that because there's fish to eat um, and they know that they're there and they're, it's an ever increasing population. So as you see more water birds, it's a great indicator that fish are also improving. And then we also track things like mussels. We have a, a, a a diverse set of mussels that live in, in the Chicago River. Mussels in the way that they reproduce, they reproduce in, in a 
it, and it really requires fish to transport the mussel larvae around. Some mussels are very specific about the type of fish that they will use to reproduce. Some are more generalists. But for the more specific mussels, we know that if we find an active mussel population, we can extrapolate that that fish also must be there because the mussels wouldn't be there if the fish wasn't there. And also, if we find a mussel population that say none of the mussels are less than 10 years old, we also know that it is very likely that at one point that fish was there and now it's not. So how do, how do we address those kind of limitations from a habitat perspective? This is one of my favorite charts. It shows the number of fish species found in the Chicago River, sort of from the passage of the Clean Water Act to, this is ends in 2005, we've added a couple to this list, so we're in the low 70s now. But essentially we've gone from 10 to the low 70s in the number of species of fish that have come back to the river as it's become cleaner over time. This is not from fish stocking, although we do some fish stocking, this is just from natural uh, migration of fish into the river system. One of the ways that we recreate habitat is uh, through these things that we call uh, catfish nesting cavities. So they're kind of catfish nests. Uh, these look like simple concrete structures and they're, they're really much more uh, technical than that. The, subs or the material that they're made out of actually filters and cleans water. It doesn't filter and clean a ton of water, but you know, every little bit helps. And the little nooks and crannies that you see in these cylinders are also space for aquatic insects and things that fish and, and other things like to eat. And while these nests are designed for channel catfish, which is an Illinois native fish that we know is present in the river, they also can be utilized by a number of other native fish uh, that we see in the river. And then we also do fish releases. So when the DNR has fish that we know are native and appropriate for the Chicago River at the end of their season, uh, we find a way to get them into our river. So we've put uh, lots of channel catfish and some northern pike and some other fish into the river over the years. As DNR funding fluctuates, the amount of fish that they uh, produce in their fisheries fluctuates, but essentially we just let them know that if they need a place to put their native fish, we can come up with that. We've done a lot of work on the North Shore Channel, planting water willow and lizard's tail in the riparian areas for additional habitat for fish and then creatures like otters and beavers and mink and things. Uh, this is a volunteer activity and we're hoping to be able to do some of these in September. So keep a close eye on our website. We do these in conjunction with the shed and um, the DNR where we get volunteers that go out into the North Shore Channel with, with those plants, put them in. And what we found over the years is in the bottom right corner, there are some freshly planted plants. If you look at that stand if you, right now today, that's all filled in uh, in thick and lush with plants. Um, these two species in particular do a really good job in this waterway. This waterway fluctuates a lot. Sometimes those plants are underwater, um, but it provides a lot of habitat, especially for fish like northern pike that use those plants to hunt, uh, hunt prey. So over the years, we've had one fish hotel We've kind of spun that into, so the Fish Hotel regrettably has is, is outlived its, its usefulness as the river walk grew, but we'll get to what it turned into. So then, then we installed 402 catfish nesting cavities throughout the system. We've released uh, 277,000 channel catfish into the system. And then also a little more than 8,000 Northern Pikes. The Fish Hotel turned into the jetty on the river walk. So as the river walk was built and developed, part of the agreement that we had with the city was we'd be happy to sort of allow the, the fish hotel to go away if they really made a big step towards uh, building in habitat to the river walk. So if you go to the jetty section of the river walk, there's some really good informational signage about the types of technologies that are, you can't see, but are under the water that really serve that same, that same, uh, uh, it serves the same benefit to the fish in the main stem that the fish hotel did. And then we've planted thousands of native riparian plants in our project in the North Shore Channel. Now we're trying to uh, increase the area of the North Shore Channel project to cover more of the watershed right now. We have some funding requests out. So uh, knock on wood, that will happen and we'll be able to expand that to other parts of the watershed. So one of the other limiting factors that I wanna cover before we get to everybody's questions is dams. So dams, 
do a lot to impact water quality in, a, in really a negative way. Uh, they can impact uh, chemical water quality, but they also impact the ability for fish to move through the system. And as fish move through the system, it improves the ecology of the system. From a recreational standpoint, they can also uh, be a drowning hazard and prevent paddlers from, from going upstream and downstream. To give you an idea of how dams affect fish species in the river, uh, there was a dam at River Park. And if you, if I, if you, if you gave the habitat conditions and the water quality conditions to a, a fisheries biologist, they would say that you should have many more species of fish upstream of that dam than downstream of that dam. But when we actually looked, we found that it was quite the opposite, that there was only half as many species upstream, there was only a third of the game species, and there were no trout or salmon upstream. So that would tell us that that dam was a real limiting factor in fish accessing the rest of the river. Uh, surprisingly, the Chicago River has a bunch of dams. So most of them are real small. You don't notice them unless you know that they're there, but there's a little low head dam at Chick Evans Golf Course in uh, Morton Grove. There's a dam called the Tam O'Shanter Dam that is in Niles. It's just uh, downstream of Howard Road. This dam in particular is interesting because you see the person standing on the head wall of the dam and notice that the river is also behind them. This is just sort of an impediment that's out in the middle of the river. I feel like you could almost go kick this one over if you, or it wouldn't take too much. Uh, Winneka Road Dam has been retired. So that was the first dam that got uh, removed. It's just downstream of the, it was just downstream of the Skokie Lagoons. So here's the, some pictures of that removal. It was pretty simple removal. And a lot of these dams were constructed in the early 20th century to maintain water levels in what was an intermittent prairie stream at the time. Now we've paved over so much of the watershed that the North Branch of the Chicago River is never dry. So these dams that were built to maintain water levels really are unnecessary and sometimes can exacerbate flooding. Uh, so it makes sense to take them out. So here's the end of the Winneka Road Dam. It's getting pulled out. There was a real dicey sort of canoe portage you had to go around there. But the biggest problem that we had in the river is that what was the River Park Dam. So the River Park Dam is the farthest downstream dam, which means it's the first one that fish had to get over. It also was a much higher sort of jump if fish were gonna make it up the dam. And we do have pictures of some salmon and things trying to get up that jump, uh, where the upstream dams under high flow conditions, fish could make their way over those dams, no problem. Uh, so this dam was technologically a bigger, a bigger deal uh, from an engineering perspective. We started working on looking at how to remove the dam in the early 2000s. Uh, we looked at things like fish ladders, um, but what we found was uh, our fish in the Midwest are not nearly as athletic as they are on the West Coast, so our fish ladder would have to be very long for fish to be able to get up the incline. So what we decided was on a project to really just take that dam out and put some rocks in to address some, some, some of the physics of the water, as it comes, some of the hydrology to allow fish to swim up and allow paddlers to go down. Um, over time, as the dam project has developed. It is also tied into a lot of really close by projects. So projects at Ronan Park, downstream at Horner, Horner Park, Legion Park, these are all either ongoing or upcoming that really will prevent, uh, uh, create a long, a long stretch of some really good habitat in the Chicago River right where the, the North Branch Dam was. So here's a picture of the dam before it was addressed. Um, here is a picture of the very beginning of just starting to try to chip away at that thing. Um, this was about two years ago right now when this was happening. Uh, what happens is the construction crew kind of uses these giant sandbags to move the water to one side of the channel and they take out half the dam and then they move the water to the other side of the channel. Here's some of those bags um, and take out the other half of the dam. It's, it, it's not, Super complicated work. It's interesting to see, and it was fun to see sort of the big equipment in there uh, working on this stuff. Here's some more pictures of them actually removing that dam. Here's a press conference. It was uh, almost two years ago, um, and they actually, the construction guys were very enthusiastic about being the chip away big chunks of the dam during during the, the, the press conference, and I think the press appreciated the show, so they had some big big hunks falling away or at, at, 
at that time. Here you can see where they're moving the water from one side to the other. This is a downstream view. This is the dam used to be at the downstream end of this picture, so it's gone in this picture. So you're starting to see those natural flows come back. All the banks here are going to be planted with native plants, uh, all the surrounding banks. So this is downstream in the, in the, in the main stem of the river, uh, downstream in the north branch. You can see where it was the dam is now a much more natural riffle. Here you can see some more construction shots, uh, replacing the rocks at the bottom there replaced a, a concrete line channel. So now we have a much more natural cobbly channel that increases water quality and provides a lot of habitat. Here's what it looks like. So the first year the dam was in was also the year that we had the polar vortex. And one of the biggest issues with these types of dam modifications are if the channel freezes and then all those rocks move. So it was a great way for us to sort of test our, our our theory that it worked and it did. So none of those rocks moved during the polar vortex and everything is kind of growing in and looks good right now. Um, here's some more pictures of the construction. So here's the picture, the heat, or the, I shouldn't say the heat, it's a bad, a bad use of words. In the thick of the polar vortex where we actually still had a stream channel, nothing moved. So it was really a successful installation. Getting to the point where in March of 2019, uh, early March of 2019, so this water is pretty cold, a couple park district employees decided they wanted to be the first one to run the new whitewater rapids on the north side and they put their canoe in and, and ran the rapids. So we've had, we went from having a dam there to now having sort of a small class one or two whitewater condition under some sometimes and then in a, a spot where fish can move. Really exciting sort of late breaking news. We're always looking at the fish populations in the river and some of those fish get tagged or they get what's called fin clips. So you take a, a little, uh, you, you mark their fins so that you'll know if you catch them again. And this year we found a fish that the last time we caught it was in the main stem downstream of this dam all the way up in the Skokie Lagoons. So that fish made it over where this dam used to be, where the Winneka Dam used to be and must have made it through the other two dams and got up to the Skokie Lagoons, which is exactly what we're looking for with these kind of projects. So with that, I will start to answer some of your questions. Okay. So let's see, I'm just gonna go from the top on the chat questions. So Emily asked, uh, can you talk more about the Clean Water Act impaired waters rule assessments in the Chicago River watershed and what the attainment status is? and what the most common criteria for non-attainment, and do you know what the next assessment will be? I don't know when the next assessment will be. Um, the IEPA does those assessments, um, but I can get that information for you and email it back. Um, some of the work of our public agencies is, is being affected by the quarantine and everything else, so it's a, um, we're definitely pushing them to, to keep on their schedules. That's not been a strong suit of the IEPA in the past. Um, Joel asked, who pays for the dam removal? Is it the Water Reclamation District? Um, the dam removals are sort of all paid by different things. So the dam removal at River Park, so the biggest one, the smaller dams were really sort of a on the scale of a $10,000 project. So they're not huge dollar amounts from a public agency's perspective. The dam removal at, Water, at River Park was a bigger project that cost you know a couple million dollars by the time it was done. The MWRD was the owner of that dam. The park district owns all the property around the dam and the Army Corps of Engineers had a hand in that dam. So the Army Corps of Engineers paid the bulk of that money and the Water Reclamation District paid for the local match for the Army Corps of Engineers. They justified it from a water quality improvement perspective. And then it also removes the liability of them having a dam. If you're watching anything about sort of the dam bursting in, in mid Michigan, there's a lot of liability that comes with dam ownership that the dam owners, there's a lot of puns with dams, that dam owners uh, like to get out of. Um, and then the park district has, has done a ton of work implementing the project and then working on the recreational asset improvements and all the plantings and the associated uh, ecological improvements. 
Okay, so then uh, kind of answered that one where the rocks put on top of the cement. So the cement was removed upstream of the dam. So if you remember where that was before the dams were at, the part of that project was the removal of that uh, ill-imagined concrete line channel and then the rocks were put in place of that. Okay, so we have a, okay, Asian carp question from Maryland. Did the Asian carp remain downstream? Were they ever a problem in the Chicago area? So we've never caught any Asian carp in the Chicago River. Uh, alive or otherwise. We've caught Asian carp about uh, 40 miles downstream of the electric barrier in Romeoville, and they've caught Asian carp weirdly in some lagoons in the Chicago Park District that are not connected to anything, which really sort of illustrates why the Asian carp are a problem. Um, the Asian carp are a problem like most aquatic invasive species in that we have uh, issues with shipping, that brings a lot of things from other parts of the world to our our ecosystem and our ecosystem is not set up to deal with those so you hear about things like the quagga mussel or the zebra mussel or the asian carp they all are impacting us we have where the asian carp aren't impact, impacting us in chicago right now and we work with uh, a lot of groups to address that part of the part of our our strategy is asian carp like a lot of invasive species really do well at edge conditions where water quality is poor or there's not habitat. So having strong water quality and strong habitat in a strong native fishery can provide a buffer from things like Asian carp. So that's part of what we're working on for that. Um, I'm gonna come back to your question, Annette, if we have some time at the end. So can you describe where catfish nests are installed and what conditions make for good catfish nest location? Yeah, so we looked at, that was part of it. I have a longer catfish presentation, but so location selection was a big part of that. Um, and most of the catfish are on the, the, the Calumet, Little Calumet River and in the North Shore Channel. What you need for catfish nests are water that's about four to six feet deep, uh, so that the top of that nest is three feet below the water line. Um, in both of those parts of the river, we don't have uh, steep drop-offs in a lot of areas, so we had areas where we could put those nests, and we have 150 nests down in the Little Calumet, uh, Calumet River in 252 nests from basically the north side of the city going up to about Green Bay Road um, on the North Shore Channel. Can more habitat be created near the Riverwalk area or are they unnecessary? Certainly more uh, habitats can be created near the Riverwalk and we're working with the city as the Riverwalk expands to make sure that habitat is expanded as it's is as as part of that and also working with other developments like the 78 or Lincoln Yards or these big developments that are in the news on the river to make sure that they're including in-stream habitat and habitat on the banks for things like birds and animals and lots of other things. So the Eugene Field Project that's part of uh, it's really part of the the larger um, North Shore, or North Branch, excuse me, North Branch River, um, the dam removal, and I showed this slide of the different Army Corps projects. So Eugene Field was, was, uh, uh, is a park that was designed to manage some storm water under really high flow conditions. So it's a park when it's not raining, but then when it rains, it fills up with water. That water is water that used to go in people's basements. So that's the trade-off is that if we design some of our open spaces to handle rainwater, it keeps it out of people's basements and things like that. Um, and that's also built into like the turtle habitat work and things that we do with native plants. What kind of plant lives uh, surrounding the river system to help diversify the river system? So we have, yeah, there's a way. So we do a lot of, of work with plants from all the way from the surrounding lands, everything in the watershed to the banks and then plants as they get down into the water. So that's where we came up with our water willow, willow and lizard's tail. We work with people like the botanic gardens and then urban rivers and really coordinate to get a better understanding of which plants do better in our ecosystem. That's something we're constantly learning about. Um, if anyone is interested in sort of what plants they, if they're interested in planting stuff in their yard or those kind of things, we can help with that. If you want to send me an email, my, my email is at the end of my presentation and all of our emails are on our website at chicagoriver.org. Um, 
on our staff contact page. Um, aquaponic method. There are um, some people that are growing plants in the in the river uh, with that method, and that was the way that the plants were grown on the um, the fish hotel. And we actually just just met this week with some students from a lab in at Northwestern University that are sort of looking at uh, some floating planters and things like that that provide habitat and, and do all these kind of things I'm talking about today. Um, is there a link from the Eugene Field Pond thing? There's not an official, no. So that's just overflow. Um, and under real high conditions, that water can get really high, but there's not an official, like a stream or a tributary or anything that goes back to the river. Um, that's just designed as that bank overflows and its water comes from the surrounding area that Eugene Field can act as a filter for that. So uh, let's see, I think we're pretty much caught up on the messages. And that asked a, mess a question earlier about um, what's going on at Bubbly Creek. So Bubbly Creek in the river is uh, uh, traditionally a very sort of polluted area that was polluted by the stockyards. There's some great historic photos of people actually walking on the on Bubbly Creek uh, in the 19th century. There was a thriving um, industry where people just skim the, the, the gross stuff off the top and turn it into soap. So it's really got a long history of industrial and and agricultural pollution. Um, and that's a project that we're working on restoring that ecosystem over the next 10 years. So I think if you go back to Bubbly Creek in the late 2020s, people are gonna be surprised by what it looks like. It's gonna be a lot of floating wetlands, and floating uh, gardens, places for people to kayak, lots of places for fish and other animals. A lot of the runoff that pollutes Bubbly Creek now will be gone as the deep tunnel comes online and be redirected and treated. So we don't have to worry about that. And it's just, uh, it's, a, it's gonna be a very interesting project. If you Google Bubbly Creek Army Corps, there's some interesting reports about what all the, um, the work that's gonna be done if you wanna get deeper into that one. Let's see, our previous Chicago clay pits affecting the river habitat in some way for better or worse. Um, I don't know about clay pits in particular, but a lot of the city is, is built on fill. So like Horner Park was a landfill. So we deal with urban, the urban environment whenever we, we create habitat. We worked on a project in Glenview uh, to do a bunch of habitat on an old um, construction debris landfill. So when we did that, we had to get you know, soil testing and different things to make sure that we wouldn't be doing more harm than good by, you know, putting roots and things into the soil. Uh, when do you think the North Branch north of the Old River Park Dam will be swimmable? Uh, well, like I said earlier, swimmable from a water quality perspective is one thing. Swimmable from an infrastructure perspective is another thing. On days when it's not raining, and it hasn't been raining, the North Branch is swimmable from water quality protect perspective right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that we know what's under the water line and sort of what stuff might be on the bottom of the channel. So I'm not telling you to go swimming, um, but I am saying that if you're in a canoe or a kayak and you fall in and it hasn't been raining, you don't really need, you shouldn't need to worry about the water conditions. Now that said, we also are taking a deeper look at that. Having disinfection in the river now allows us to really pinpoint places where we might have, might have had an issue, but we couldn't tell. Uh, and now that we have all that background noise out of the system, we can start to see if there was an illicit discharge or things where we wouldn't be able to tell, tell before. How many dams are there in the Chicago River system? Uh, there were eight dams, uh, so we're whittling that down. Um, a couple of them are like the Skokie River or the Skokie Lagoons are formed by a dam, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't impact that one. There actually are some, some, some ways for fish to get around that dam right now. Um, but there are eight dams. And then one of the dams is at a golf course and it is welded in a sort of permanent upright position. So technically while it is a dam, it's not gonna ever go down. So uh, I'll say eight, but six is what we're trying to get rid of. Okay. I'm gonna get any more questions. I'm gonna give time for one more question and then I think I'm gonna wrap it up for today and just remind everybody to take a look at our Future topics, um, I, some of them are going to definitely overlap with the, the talk I gave today. Um, 
especially the upcoming deep tunnel and wildlife habitat project. Oh. Okay, I'm not seeing any more. So thanks a lot. Get outside and enjoy the weather.